Uh, okay, first I will have two technical questions. Does everyone hear me, or do I need to use the mic? Uh, I'd rather not, but if, if it's okay, okay, that, then I'll speak without the mic. And the second technical question is, does everyone have a handout? Because they might be useful. Um, if not, I have some uh, more here at my disposal. Okay, um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here and for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to such a distinguished uh, audience. And now to uh, punishment. Uh, the ancient Athenians were apparently quite fond of punishing, or at least of talking about it. The Greek forensic discourse presents us with a vast and apparently inexhaustible amount of terms which could be used to signify punishment. Inexhaustible because the Greek orators frequently express the idea of punishment by uh, figuratively, for example, by means of metonymy, say, the concrete or the abstract. There is killing instead of punishing with death. There is literally throwing away instead of punishing with exile. There is disenfranchising instead of punishing with disenfranchisement. There is becoming a debtor instead of being punished with a fine and so on. The proper words, however, the verba propria, denoting punishment, are also numerous. Kolazen, Dicken Lambanen, and Didonai, and Epitinium are perhaps the most general terms. Uh, the, the, they are explained in handout number one, two, three. Um, most general terms uh, denoting perhaps all or most kinds of punishment, of penalties, from monetary through disenfranchisement to capital punishment. Uh, the term Zemia, this is handout number four, is curiously circumscribed to the two extremes. That is, on the one hand, monetary penalties, on the other, capital punishment, though usually with the added qualifier, hand, for example, hand um, Timoria, and its uh, related verb, timorein or timoreistai, more frequently than not, this is handout number five, by the way, more frequently than not, uh, refers to penalties affecting the person, and as such is uh, sometimes seen to be explicitly opposed to monetary penalties. This is passage number five, actually. Um, the problem, however, is not the sheer number of these terms, but the fact that they come from different semantic spheres and these semantic spheres also mark their presence in the discourse of the orators. Um, Zemia, for instance, is frequently seen, this is handout number six, is frequently seen to signify damage, both in the sense of loss and in the sense of indemnity or compensation. Uh, both Dicken, Lambanen, Didomai, and Timoria uh, are used by the orators, so this is, by the way, handout number seven to eight, uh, are used by the orators to express the ideas of compensation on the one hand and revenge, including also violent, extra-legal revenge on the other. Uh, thus, we are faced apparently with a, with a conundrum where the crucial, at least to our understanding of law terms, distinctions between punishment on the one hand and revenge compensation on the other are, well, seen almost totally blurred with these keywords. It has been suggested uh, by Shai Tissinier, for example, this is uh, handout number nine, that it is the syntax and pragmatics that hold the key to disentangling this semantic sort of maze. Uh, the argument runs that when the subject, or more, or rather the agent of penalty, because we're not speaking always about, we're not dealing with a precise grammatical subject, so 
why I prefer the, the term agent of penalty. And also, I should explain myself, I'm using, I'm somewhat stretching the meaning of the term penalty to make it into an umbrella term covering all the other concepts. So when the agent of penalty is an individual, an idiotics, for instance, the prosecutor, it is more likely to be understood as either compensation or revenge. When the agent of penalty is the decast, the court that is, the police, the laws, the people, we would be more entitled to understand this in such cases as punishment. Now, this intuitively obvious observation is based on one defining feature of punishment, that is authority. As observed by Hart, punishment must be imposed and administered by an authority constituted by a legal system. Um, the Dicastic Court in Athens was such authority, of course. It represented the entire community, the entire citizen body, the true um, sovereign, or perhaps even the master of Athens. That's jokingly related to Aristophanes in the Nights. And um, to push this metaphor a bit further, we could point to um, an apt observation made by Courtois, who uh, claims that, almost observes that, the master does not take revenge on his servants, he punishes them. He punishes them because he has authority over them. No such authority, however, could be claimed by one idiotis, one individual, over another, as long as both were, of course, um, enfranchised male citizens. Uh, thus, when a plaintiff in a private suit for damages um, seeks to deacon Lambani, we would be justified in understanding this as seeking compensation. When a prosecutor in a private suit for homicide seeks timoria, is the agent, oh, sorry, we had a technical problem. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> seeks timoria, we would also be justified in such case to understand this as revenge. The fact that both these cases are mediated through the law courts does not really change anything in the mutual egalitarian relationship between the two antagonists. A victim of an offense, an individual, might also have the possibility and the stamina to right a wrong he himself has suffered by means of a public prosecution like the humiliating slap Hebris suffered by Demosthenes at the hands of Medias. Um, such offenses were nominally considered to affect the entire community as a whole. We can uh, see the relevant passage of number four and 14, sorry, in the handout. Um, and as such, since they were considered to affect nominally the entire community, they were open to volunteer prosecution by any Athenian, any enfranchised Athenian, who wished to do so. However, as long as it was the victim himself of such offense, who took the role of this volunteer prosecutor, and by the way, such was the usual practice, then uh, the relationship between the two parties remained essentially the same, an egalitarian relationship of compensation, or more likely, revenge, as stated, by the way, quite explicitly by Demosthenes in handout number 15. But what if there was no individual victim and no individual offense? What if we were dealing with an offense directed against the entire community at large, like drawing an unlawful decree, proposing an inexpedient law, treason, desertion, impiety? 
Of course, such cases, cases such as these, were also brought to court by volunteer prosecutors, but this time, the aggrieved party was really, and not just nominally, the state. The relationship between the two parties is, therefore, no longer egalitarian, but hierarchical. A relationship not of revenge and compensation, but of punishment. In passages number um, 16 to 17, Lycurgus, in his speech against the Ocrates, fleshes out this theoretical model. It is, according to Lycurgus, the decasts who punish Colazze, who have the authority to punish Kirius on thus Colazze. And what is the role of the volunteer prosecutor? Well, according to Lycurgus, uh, this is given in uh, number 16, it is merely to bring the crime to the attention of the court. Menil. And all the while, perhaps, maintaining a disinterested attitude oh, sorry, towards the offender himself, as might be gathered from um, passage number 19. What emerges from these passages is a familiar model of the division of labor, so to say, where the authority to punish the laws of the court, and the role of the prosecutor is to inform and to prove. And yet, the discursive practice of the Greek orators is quick to dismantle this theoretical model, as we frequently see the prosecutor in strictly public cases, in cases of wrongs affecting the entire community with apparently no individual victim, we see the prosecutor as the agent of penalty. In Lysias, or pseudo Lysias, this is um, hand up on the penalty, we are told that Andosides is said to have thought it right to punish someone else, Deacon Labbe, for impiety. The same Andosides in his own defense speech, hand up number 21, is seen to promise to prosecute and punish other people for tax-related felonies. Demosthenes reproaches Esthenes again and again, these are passages number 22 to 25, for failing or not seeking to punish him, that is Demosthenes, for his own alleged offenses against the police. In Demosthenes' speech against Androtion, this is handout number 26, Androtion is claimed to have been disenfranchised, disenfranchised himself actually, and therefore unable to deacon Lambani either for the sake of himself in a private lawsuit or for the sake of the police in a public one. Last but not least, on many occasions, we see the, the individual, the idiotes, the prosecutor, as agent, as an agent of penalties expressed metonymically by means of the concrete for the abstract, as Ischines, who is said to have disenfranchised Timarchus or Medias. The, the relevant passages are in number 28 in the hand. Now, <clears throat> why? Why would the prosecutor, in a strictly public case, with apparently no individual victim, why would a prosecutor be represented or represent himself as an agent of penalty? First, this may be, a sim this may be simply a linguistic and rhetorical phenomenon. Um, Greek verbs have frequently a causative force uh, most readily rendered into the English idiom as to have something done. For instance, to have someone punished, or in French, faire punir. And though this uh, particular force is usually associated with the middle voice, the active 
also offers the opportunity of such um, translation. As seen, for example, in the Dupé translation of Demosthenes' false embassy speech. Um, Aeschylus is quite literally said to have punished Timarchus, to disenfranchise, to have disenfranchised him, or to have ruined him, but perhaps in the sense to have him punished, to have him disenfranchised, or to have caused this ruin. Now, the reason for phrasing Timarchus' punishment in this particular way uh, seems pretty obvious. I do not think that Demosthenes was interested in vesting um, Aeschines with punitive authority or with any authority whatsoever, for that matter. But elsewhere, he is seen to deplore the fate of Timarchus, of his former associate, um, unjustly, as Demosthenes claimed, punished. And thus, in making Aeschines into the agent of this penalty, Demosthenes manages to both have the cake and eat the cake. That is to maintain a highly critical stance towards the punishment suffered by Timarchus as a judicial decision, but without having to criticize the decusts for it, and thus without risking, without running the risk of alienating them. This was purely Eschines' affair. Second, in stepping out as a volunteer prosecutor, the idiotus, the individual, might want to settle an unrelated personal quarrel. This is the phenomenon of vindictive prosecution, of which I have tried to give um, a more detailed account elsewhere. Uh, I should, however, say that such vindictive prosecutors are quite clear that they are avenging their own personal wrongs, and, or they're pursuing their own personal enmity, even when at the same time, they claim to seek penalties for the sake of the polis. Uh, we may find some relevant passages in number 29 of the handout. Now, the third and most interesting answer is that the idiotes, in fact, was also a victim. Not the victim like the vindictive prosecutor of an earlier unrelated offense, but the victim of the very public offense that was under trial. This is stated most, most vividly in the Demosthenic speech um, for Formion, where it is uh, said that Apollodorus um, considered it fit to deacon la belle, to punish the agent of the penalty uh, for public wrongs in which he himself has been wronged only in part. I should add that these public offenses were most likely, they were mentioned just a moment earlier uh, in this passage cited, uh, were mo most likely charges of high treason, probably prosecuted by means of a sanguinia. And therefore, we would be dealing with perhaps the most general offenses directed against the entire police, affecting the entire community. And yet, the prosecutor, as part of that community, could be considered as partly, but directly, harmed by this public offense. Even the Corvus, this is passage number um, 31, claims that a person guilty of a public offense should be considered a personal enemy by every upstanding citizen. And the logical conclusion of um, putting things this way is that even in the case of strictly public wrongs, directed against the entire parties, the individual, the idiotes, can be discursively constructed as an agent of penalty, or perhaps, more specifically, revenge. As such, the idiotes the volunteer prosecutor is also seen to punish, perhaps to take revenge, on the offender along with the decas. Some other passages may be found in number 32. This in turn may suggest that the decas themselves could be constructed as agents of revenge, demoted, so to say, from the hierarchical relationship 
with the offender to a more egalitarian one. Quite like the wronged individual, whether he would be acting legally or not, the dikas are asked to oh, that's here. The dikas are asked to act, to punish, perhaps to take revenge, in anger. This is the passage number 33 also in the handout. Quite like the offended individual, including the vindictive prosecutor, the dikas too are also asked to be to consider the offender their own personal enemy. They are admonished also to feel hatred towards them and to punish them thus. And quite like an individual, they can also be approached from the opposite angle, that of positive reciprocity, with yet another essentially egalitarian concept, that of kindness, gratitude. And up number 35, or some more details. What emerges from such rhetoric is a model alternative to that sketched out by the groups. The prosecutor, the idiotes, is here not merely the agency bringing the offense and the offender to the attention of the decasts, but himself engaged, along with every other member of the community, represented, of course by the decasts, engaged in an act of communal and yet highly personal revenge. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your paper.